many are already glad that you came this morning. Oh, the presence of God is so sweet. Welcome to the Feast of Trumpets 2013. How many know that started this week? And uh, just the presence of God has been just unusually real. Uh, it was, his presence was that real last week. It's like when we began the service, you know, you, you kind of stop and say, Lord, I want to make sure you're here and you're cool with everything, you know. And, and it's like he was right here saying, I'm already here. And it's been that way all week. There's just been uh, just visitations of you know, you start to go through your regular prayer, and it just his presence interrupts the prayer. And he says, hey, can I get a word in edgewise here, and I want to talk. And I, I want to share some things that God has just been putting in my heart. There's getting ready to be released a fresh wind from the king. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I want to look at some basic things about this season that we're in and the Feast of Trumpets. In Leviticus chapter 23, starting with verse 23, and it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And ye shall do no servantile work therein, but ye shall make an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now the rabbis have taught over the years that there are ten primary remembrances to this time of uh, the, the fall feasts. Got to get my right remote here or we're not going anywhere. It is the coronation of the king. I think that's one of the reasons why praise and worship this time of year is just a little bit sweeter. Because I think in heaven there's a coronation going on. Oh. Hmm. Every once in a while I just get a glimpse of it and it's like, oh Lord, you're just too good. You're just too awesome. Also, with the ten days of awe, it's a call to repentance. It also celebrates or remembers the giving of the Torah at Sinai because the Torah cycle is restarted at Rosh Hashanah or the or Yom Torah, the Feast of Trumpets. It's a warning of impending judgment. And how many know that needs to be given a clarion call in the earth today? There is more junk going on and more stuff that needs to be judged than I have ever seen in my life. It's also a remembrance of the destruction in the future, rebuilding of the temple, of also of the binding of Isaac, they believe occurred at this time. When God said, I'll provide a lamb. And how many are glad that when John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing, he pointed out his old bony finger and said, there is the Lamb of God, the one that Abraham was looking for, the one that we have been looking for for 2,000 years. He walks the shores of Galilee. There is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Oh, i got to preach on this morning. The fear of God. Isn't it interesting that the body has to be reminded of the fear of the Lord. We have a modern church today that does not believe that it has to fear God. They act like God should fear them because, you know, if God just don't do this just right, I'm pulling back my funds and leaving. And they just model the church any way they want. They will model the way the, they, they try to re-image God. There's no fear of God. You see, when there's a fear of God, you take him just like he is. And he takes you just like you are, but then he doesn't leave you that way. Aren't you glad? We all arrive a mess, and then we're recreated in Christ Jesus. It's the day of judgment, Yom Kippur. Next week, we're going to be getting into that. That is actually a, a, one of the most holy times, one of the most reverential times of the year, because it's a dress rehearsal of the Valley of Armageddon. You see, the church has thought and the world has thought that it's gotten away with things for thousands and thousands of years. 
But how many know that not only are the evil on this earth and all the elite, but how many know that the Antichrist himself, the personification of Lucifer, has his comeuppance coming? He's going to think that he has won. He's going to think that he's ruling and reigning and that he's going to conquer. And all it takes is Jesus showing back up and speaking a word. A sword shall proceed out of his mouth and shall slay them all. You see, so many times we think, well, God, I need you to move your hand. I need you to do this and rearrange that. All you need is a word. All you need is for him to say, blessed. And it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be hard for the devil to come against it. All he's going to have to do is say, free. All I need is a word. And all it's going to take is Jesus saying a word on that right horse when he comes back. And it's the end of the war. The ingathering of Israel, tabernacles, the resurrection of the dead, all of that is about the fall feast. And, and I'm just amazed at all the years that I was in church and I went right by the fall feast like they were nothing when they were everything. Just trying to survive getting through Halloween to try to make it to Thanksgiving and Christmas. This year, if you notice, we actually have Thanksgiving occur. Because <laughs> it's Hanukkah and Thanksgiving on the same day. There's even rumors that Adam Sadler is writing a new song. <laughs> Just to commemorate it. Going right by the fall feast. While I'm looking and trying to ponder the mysteries of the book of the revelation of Jesus. Not realizing that the fall feasts were the key. They're the key. Why are there so many different positions on the book of Revelation? Because very few of them ever take into consideration God's timetable and God's symbols. We try to, we try to interpret it with a Greco-Roman mindset. We quit being Hebrews. Babylon looks at the things of God and just ponders and can't figure it out. The Bible said Lucifer himself, if he would have known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If he didn't figure out the spring feast, you think he's going to figure out the fall ones? My God's too smart. God on his worst day with a migraine and no caffeine in the morning can outthink the devil at his best. But how many know God never needs caffeine? God never, God never has a migraine. But you know what I'm talking about. If there was a day that God's power ebbed on that worst day in all of creation, he's a billion times more powerful than Lucifer at the height of his power. That ought to just make you feel good right there. It's also associated with some other things, the 10 days of all and the wedding feast. How many of there's a wedding feast coming? You see, as I, as I look at the fall feast, I do believe in a rapture. I just think it's going to happen a whole lot later than we have ever dreamed. I just finished a book this week by Dr. George Ladd. He was professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. It was called The Blessed Hope. And uh, there are a lot of things about the development of the pre-tribulation rapture that uh, uh, the pre-tribulationists do not tell us about. To include many of their uh, champions when it first started, later on renounced it. To include several editors of the Schofield Bible renounced dispensationalism after they matured and thought it through just a little bit. Wonderful, wonderful book. One of the most honest guys I've ever met in my life. He just lays it out historically. Because the, our blessed hope is not the rapture. Our blessed hope is the return of the Lord. It's not in a pre-tribulation rapture. It's when Jesus comes back is our blessed hope. And when he comes back and that final trump sounds and we're out of here, I believe that is, that is with the Feast of Trumpets. It's shown in the Feast of Trumpets. And there's 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement called the Days of Awe. Well, it's interesting, in biblical times, weddings usually happened on Wednesday because the bride was given three days to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom, and the wedding feast would last for seven days. So she would start Sunday, he'd come on Wednesday, and then it would go for seven days. So it's a full 10 days. How many of when we get to heaven, we get three days to prepare for the wedding feast? Then there's a wedding ceremony. And then we come back, 
as we watch our husband. Come on now, there's, there's, a, there's a place in the book of Revelation. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory unto him for the bride has made herself ready. His wife has made herself ready. And we watch our husband come back. Kosher this planet. Called the Day of Atonement. And so while the earth is getting 10 days of woe, we're getting 10 days of woe. I like that woe better, don't you? And also within the tradition of the kings of Israel, the king is in the field. And the 10 days of all, another link to the Feast of Trumpets in the day, and 10 days of all was the tradition of the kings of Israel to be in the field during those days, which meant that anyone could approach the king. Anyone could make supplication to the king. He was there waiting out in the field waiting for those within the kingdom to come and talk to him. And let me tell you something. During the days of all, the king is in the field right now. And he's wait- And this time he came with a boatload of stuff to give to the body to help prepare it. There's some balm of Gilead in his, in his caravan. There's some healing. There's some, some deliverance. Some destiny altering. How many are tired of the devil altering your destiny in God? Altering that which should be. He's constantly trying to get you off track, to get you to turn to the right hand or to the left hand. And God is saying, I'm getting ready to come back to bring you back on course. I don't know about you. That just makes me happy. Now, bring, I want to bring in what we've been teaching on uh, the a kingdom paradigm of reality together with the, with the Feast of Trumpets and, and what we're getting ready to walk through. It, it, it just kind of gelled together. I had no idea. I thought I was actually going to kind of pause and do the feast this year and then pick back up after I get back from, from Tennessee after, after the Feast of the Tabernacles. And God says, no, you didn't know that it's all connected together and it's all kind of blending together. Uh, that's why I love God because he even takes me by surprise. Even when I'm teaching what I'm teaching, it's like, oh, oh. Oh, this goes to this. How many are so, I'm, I'm so glad God's so much smarter than me. And, the, and guys, you want to know the truth? The only time I really sound smart is when I learn to listen. Because <laughs> it's his smarts, and I just kind of pick up on it and share it with you. We have already discussed that everything that happens within our world has three components, spirit, soul, and body. And that everything that is happening in this world is breathed by a spirit. And how many know that there's evil flourishing in this world? One of the things that I have come to realize is that what we call civilization is a thin veneer. I mean, it is so thin it is alarming. Not just, well, oh, yeah, all the bad things happening in Africa and all those bad things happening in the Middle East. I mean here in America. I watched Glenn Beck last night, and I sat and I wept and I cried. And this was something that happened in 2007 that would have made Genghis Khan turn around and couldn't even look at it. It was the most barbaric tragedy that I have ever think has ever happened in the history of our nation and the media wouldn't even touch on it. Have you ever noticed that all of our news is scripted? Now if it's if and guys that there is no prejudice within me. I don't care if you're black, white, yellow, pink, polka dotted, whatever. It it doesn't matter. We are one race. There is not the black race, the right race. We are the human race. And it takes all of us together walking in the power of God to manifest the glory of God. Whites can't do it by themselves. It's going to take the white community, the black community, the Asian community, the Latino community, every community. of it. The Bible says every, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. When you get them all together, it shows the image of God. But in the media, if a white person does something to a black person, it's extrapolated forever. If a black person does something to a white person, it's covered up. And so is black on black. I mean, right now in America, there are places that are nothing short of war zones. 
children in Chicago, now they always talk, Chicago's supposed to be the progressive city in America, or, you know, the, the, the political machine and all this stuff. It's just Babylon that kids are gunned down in, in their own streets trying to get back and forth from school. It's horrific, but the media doesn't cover any of that unless it's to simply take away our guns or some other agenda. But the real violence, you see, the real hate, it's not it's black thing or a white thing or a Hispanic thing. It's that man without Jesus is totally depraved. The total depravity of man is a spiritual fact. And because those in government and those in education have been taking us away from God, you remove God, all you have is, is the, the horrors of hell. They're pushing us toward anarchy. There is this thin veneer. And there is a spirit that's breathing that in and empowering that and filling men's hearts with hatred. It doesn't matter if it's a white man hating a black man, a black man hating a white man, or we all just gang up on the Jews and say it's all their fault. It is hate toward another portion of the image of God in the earth. And let me tell you something. To hate a Jew or to hate a black man or to hate an Asian is to hate yourself. Because we are all in his image and we are all one. But everything that, that there are only two spirits that breathe through this world. The spirit of truth which the world cannot receive. Isn't that what Jesus said? And the spirit of error which controls the world's systems. We need to understand that all finance, how many know Wall Street is controlled by the spirit of error? If it wasn't, a child could understand what was going on up there. You get into derivatives and into and, and stock options and into and, and, and speculation and into all these things. It takes a Ph.D. in something to be able to understand it because it's all a shell game. It's all a ruse, and it's all a way to legally steal. And it's the same way in politics. We have those who can't even rule their own lives trying to rule us. And we no longer vote on the ethics of the man and look at his family and, and how he takes care of those that he loves. We look at how much he's going to promise us out of the coffers of something that many times we don't even put anything into. Let me tell you something. The whole concept of, of entitlement is from the very depths of hell to get you to the place where you want what doesn't belong to you you want, you want the work of others to benefit you, but you don't realize that it's in the work that you're added worth to yourself. Does that make sense? It's, it's in the creative force of God flowing through us to create worth in the world that gives us purpose, that gives us meaning. And if you take that out, all you have is an empty hole that anger and hatred and depravity fills. That's why when you get somebody saved, they become productive. Because the creativity of God begins to fill that place. You see, if you get filled up with love, there's no place for anger. If you get filled up with, with God's grace, there's no place for hatred. But everything is, is and guys, in, in today, we are so close to pre-Nazi Germany worldwide than I have ever seen before. When you really understand what was going on, the level of hatred and the murmur and all this, it's, and, and, and the, the, the promise of everything for nothing and all these different things. We're so close to that. We're so close in America to the French Revolution. Because you declare liberty and freedom without God, that's what you get. And how many know that when uh, our founding fathers looked at what went on in France and they were disgusted, the body of Christ was disgusted because anything that didn't agree with them, they just simply cut off their heads, the guillotine. And then they began killing one another for power. And it was all based on lies and just the atrocities that went on and, and just the absolute lack of anything decent. 
that founded that. And what happened? What happened with the French Revolution? It prepared the people for Napoleon. It prepared the people for a dictator. The things that are going on in the world today is setting the stage for the Antichrist. We've already, I mean, we've already had guys at the UN say, whether he be God or the devil, if he can solve our problems, we'll follow him. They're actually calling and preparing. The publishing company for the UN is called Lucius Trust. Lucius is just the Latin name for Lucifer. It was originally called Lucifer Trust until Christians began to raise a stink, so they thought, well, they're so stupid, they can't speak Latin. Lucius. Well, some of us be that smart. Okay. What God began to tell me this week, and just began to prepare my heart, that we need to realize that the spirit of error its wind in the earth today is about hurricane level. It really is. All it would take for us to have World War III in the Middle East is the wrong guy passing gas at the wrong time. That's how close it is. The wrong guy getting shot. The wrong, wrong word said. Even, even our own government doesn't realize, you know, we went into Iraq, we went into Afghanistan, neither one of those had treaties with Iran and Russia for protection. Do you notice what Putin said this week? He said, if you go in without a UN resolution, we will consider it an act of aggression. That's treaty talk for if you go in and it's an act of aggression, we are, we are required by treaty to come in and attack you. I mean, the finger is on the trigger, and it's a hair trigger. But God is saying, listen, hell can never do what God can outdo. And there is a wind of heaven that God is getting ready to release to counter the hurricane forces of the enemy today. I am about tired of the hurricane winds of hell. I want the breath of heaven. And when you look at how the fall feast set it up, it sets us if we'll not just go through the road, but we actually begin to spiritually embrace the fall feast. It prepares us for that wind of heaven that's coming. Let's look at the first one, the day of atonement factor. Leviticus chapter 23, picking up with verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls and make an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever... Soul is it be that shall but not be afflicted in that same day shall be cut off from among his people. How many know when the real day of atonement gets here? Those that have not bowed the knee to Jesus, their tears. They refuse to bow. They're going to be cut off. And whatsoever soul it doth any work in the same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no matter of work, and it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And it shall be unto you a, re a rest, the Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. Notice he's saying, rest, this is a work of God. You're not going to do it. You're going you're to rest in him. It's a work of Messiah. But twice afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at evening, even evening till even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Now, this Hebrew word, anah, in Hebrew means to afflict, to humble, to bow down, to become low. You see, during the ten days of all, what God is calling us to do 
is to make sure that everything is right between us and him. I've got to prepare the way for humility to take hold in my heart. I've got to prepare the way for me to really get right with God and to make sure that everything in my life is under the blood. Everything has been repented of. That, uh, you see, when, when, when the Spirit of God moves, you're humbled. Anytime, guys, and there have been some things that people have called revival in the earth, and, uh, in America, and people have gotten haughty about it. You know, it's like, I have this experience, and you don't. And they're lifting up their nose. That's the spirit of error. Any man, any woman who has ever been touched by God has been humbled by the experience. Historically, anytime God shows up, they fall down on their face before him. That, in a sense, is that to bow down, to anah. If I will humble myself before God, I am prepared for what God's getting ready to do in this season. If I don't, it'll miss me right by, and I'll get continually get filled with the winds of the spirit of error. What needs to be our watchwords are humility, fasting, repentance, and humbling ourselves before God breaks the hold of the spirit of error on your life. It breaks the hold. Any place in your life that won't bow to Jesus, you need to earmark for destruction. Nebuchadnezzar says, if you bow, you burn. And Jesus says, what won't bow is going to burn. Because what, what God wants to do is God wants to break his hold in our lives and to prepare a place for his spirit to fill afresh with power, revelation, and the king's will. That's why the king is in the field. He wants to tell his secrets to you. He wants, to, he wants his will to be known to you and to receive a, a fresh blessing from heaven. Which takes us to phase two. The tabernacle factor. Oh. You know, although there's some controversy among Hebraic-minded scholars as to the season of our Lord's birth, some say it was in the spring, many others say it was in the fall, I tend to agree with those that say it was in the fall because it kind of fits more the biblical pattern. Emmanuel, God with us, God came and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. I really think it's during the fall feast that our Lord was born. Uh, in fact, it was probably during the, he, some even have gone as far as to say they believe that he was born the first day of tabernacles and that he was circumcised on the eighth day, the last great day of tabernacles on that eighth day. But an interesting uh, story in the narrative of the Lord's birth comes to mind that there was no room for him in the inn. Why was there no room? Was it because everyone was going to Jerusalem for tabernacles? No, it's because Caesar said, you know what, I'm going to scrap what the Word of God says, and I'm going to make you go someplace that I prescribe. And so everybody was busy appeasing Babylon, and because they were busy appeasing Babylon, they had no room for the Savior to tabernacle. And what God is saying is if you repent and you humble yourselves, you're making room for him to come and to dwell, to make his abode, to tabernacle within us. There is going to be a special anointing being released from heaven that's going to enable us to make greater room for him and his influence in our lives that will enable him to tabernacle there, and heaven stressed this this morning, and to remain. We're not talking visitation. We're talking moving. You see, there. I think the reason why the, why the king's in the field is there's a moving van behind him. He's saying, I'm looking for places I can move in, make myself at home. That means I've got to give him the right to rearrange the furniture of our lives. How many know that something happens after you get married? You know, you guy, you had your place, and then you get married, 
all of a sudden all this girl stuff starts showing up in your place. What's she doing? She's making herself at home, isn't she? And truth be known, she's making a house a home, making it someplace. And so a woman will have an impact because she moved in. Of course, the guy always should have his traditional man cave that uh, he can put some of his relics that used to fill his place and at least have a little cave he can stick it in. But when Jesus moves in, he wants to bring his stuff with him. He wants to bring his routines in. He wants to bring... Th- this, is, this is what God told me this morning. He wants a new and abiding level of his presence in your life. How many of us have had times where just God seems so close? It could have been during a church service. It could have been during prayer time. I mean, God was just so close. God wants that to be the starting point to be normal and to move you up. He wants a new and abiding level of his guidance, a new and abiding level of his instruction, a new and abiding level of his vision, of his provision, and his protection. That's what, that's what the king is in the field bringing with him in this season, and my job is to make room for him. You see, part of the 10 days of awe is to get rid of anything that offends the king. I want you to come through my house, Lord. And, you know, there's, every house has a back room. It's where you hide all your junk in. And there's always that closet. Don't ever open that closet without at least having three people to go like this to make sure that things don't tumble out on you. You see, what Jesus wants to do is he not only wants to go into the front part of the house that you clean and that you have ready for guests, he's, he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm, let me take a look at that back room. Let me take a look at that back closet. Because, you know, there's some stuff back there you may have forgotten about that there's an idol back there. There's, there's, some, there's some influence of Babylon back there. There's a Babylonian garment laying back there that you forgot about, that it's still in, in, in stealth, it's still creeping in and giving influence in your household. And the king says, I want to get rid of that because I want to be the only influence. You see, I've come, I've come to move in, but I've also come to move in to establish my throne and to reign from here. Hmm. You know you're going to get to see him rule and reign from Jerusalem if he's ruling and reigning from your living room. Ruling and reigning from your back room, your back closet on forward. Or for some of us, we're in farm country, the back shed. Oh! I mean, some of us have back sheds that even the chickens won't go. (laughs) It's a scary place, and God said, let me help clean that out. We got to make room for him, guys. That's the season that we're in, and the king is in the field right now saying, if you'll talk with me about real stuff, I'll talk to you about real stuff. If you talk to me about what's really bugging you, I'll help you get to understand the very core root issues of what's bugging you so that we can deal with it because the king is in the field. Because he wants that fresh air, that fresh breeze of the Holy Spirit released in you. I'm not just talking about our services. Because, guys, everything that we have done with biblical life, now everybody's about church building. But if you don't build the individual to build the family, the church means nothing because it will implode on itself the first time the devil raises up. We got a church building, a nice church building. I wish I had the money to buy the church building that we have for sale in town. And it was all because it was all about, in a a sense, because when you go the traditional way of building, it's about building the building, getting the the funds up and all that. It has to be about building the the individual first and then the family. Because you see, if the individual gets mad, then he gets all the otherites mad. And there's a couple of Absaloms in there, and there's a Jezebel over here, and then there's an Ahab over here. You'll just split that thing right down the middle. And then the bank ends up with the church building. But it has to be the individual first because this building can be taken away. Do you know that? There are places right now on the earth that it's illegal for a Christian church to have a building 
Or if you're in Egypt right now, they simply mark them and burn them down, hopefully with you in them from their perspective. This could be taken away, but your individual walk with God and the strength of the family cannot. The kingdom is about individual, family, then church, then community. And the king is wanting to first zero in on target the individual and then let it begin to transform the family and then church becomes a breeze. I've seen pastors right now that are just run to death because it was all about building the church and not building the individual and the family. And the, and the chaos and the turmoil in the families are not only eating up the families, they're about to kill their pastors because the pastors really care and are, are, are just, you know, one man's not made to put out 500 fires a week. When you take care of the individual and the family, that family don't have fires. I don't like drama. The Bible says where there's evil, there's chaos, and there's disorder, there's every evil work. I like the peace of God. Some days I just run home, get on my property, and go, oh. <laughs> Quite because it's like a beehive up here in town. <laughs> and you look at the people, they just, just say something, I'll knock you out. Now that's bad when that's the guy waiting on you. <laughs> to say the wrong thing, I'm gonna take that I'm gonna take that lamb chop and I'm gonna beat you to death with it. Just go ahead and say it. You think I'm I'm being funny, but how many other places in America it's happening? You have somebody say the wrong thing to a cashier or something, and the cashier ends up going off, and I mean it's on, guys. And that's happening more and more and more. Because all the chaos and all the, the wind of, of hell has pushed the people about as far as they can go. And these people are just, just this far from this absolute murderous rage. But you know what? If the king is walking with you, he can walk into that situation and say, peace be still. I want all of us, not just me, I want all of us to be to the place where the king's presence is so with us that when we walk into a place, it changes the atmosphere. The peace comes. Even the dogs and cats quit fighting when you're around. Now, when you leave, it may be on, but while you're there, it's that, that presence of God. Come on. And to do that, guys, I mean, there's some change that all of us are going to have to do. Just, Lord, start with my stinking attitude and work on up from there. <laughs> Come on. Work on my laziness, my spiritual laziness, and then let's take it on from there. I, teach me where the spirit of error got in, got me off, and get me back on, and get its influence out of my life that the, 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 the glory of God, the weight of God's presence can come there and begin to have the shalom of God manifest in that area. Isn't it interesting that we call sickness in the, in the earth dis-ease? Well, if you get rid of the dis, what do you got? Ease. The shalom of God. The peace of God. It's a lack of peace that causes a lot of problems. Lack of peace with self. A lack of peace with one another. A lack of peace with God. A lack of peace with your past. A lack of peace of any hopeful future. God can change all that. And that's where we're at. Say, Mike, how much am I supposed to fast and pray between now and the Day of Atonement as much as the Holy Spirit tells you? I warn Mary. Now, if I come home, I may not eat this week. I may not eat today. I may not, you know, just, just be prepared. I'm just going to, my flesh may squeal like a stuck pig, but you know what? It can just squeal on because it's going to get crucified because I want to make sure that when I get to the Day of Atonement, everything belongs to the King. Every attitude, every concept, every part of my being. And I plan on starting with the back room and working forward in my life. And I encourage you to do the same. Father, we just welcome the presence of the Spirit of Truth. Spirit of Truth, come into our lives in a greater and more r real way than ever before. 
And Father, right now as a congregation, we bind up the spirit of error over our lives, over our families, off of our health, off of our finances, off of our mindsets, off of our traditions, off every single area of our lives. We bind up the spirit of error. And Holy Spirit, we invite you come and take over and to correct and to bring control and to bring kingdom into every area of our lives. Let us walk with fear before God these 10 days that we can be prepared for our king when he returns. Father, this is something that no man can do. It's something only your spirit can do. And Father, we just ask, we we come into agreement with heaven. Father, loose that anointing. Loose that breeze of heaven this morning. Loose the fire of God. Father, our desire is that when we get to the day of atonement, not only are we humbled before the king, but that we're going to have an offering made by the fire of the Holy Ghost in our lives, that he's going to burn up the flesh, that he's going to burn up the sin, that he's going to burn up the works of Babylon that have been established in us, that we could be holy and blameless before you, Father. Father, we thank you. We trust in you to do it. We do not trust in the arm of the flesh, but we trust in the Spirit of God. Father, we thank you, and we praise you for it this morning. 